everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another of our artist conversations. And today our guest is Joe Cantillo. And uh, I, there's, there's much I can say about Joe, and we'll get into it we'll start when we start talking in a second. But, uh, you know, his, his, his formal name is Jose Pablo Cantillo, and uh, he grew up in the small Midwestern town of Terre Haute. That's what it says in your bio. Wow. How big is Terre Haute? 70,000 people, maybe. 70. That's not that small. That's, that's like twice the size of the town I grew up in. I really? Grew up in, yeah, I grew up in uh, Mill Valley, just north of San Francisco. I don't know how big it is now, but at the time it was about 34,000. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, East then we're, LA, we're where I huge. went to school was that big. See, that's the thing. Like most Big Ten universities or major universities are like the size of the town I grew up in. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Um, anyway, uh, Joe is, is a, a well-known film and television actor, and uh, you can see his work in Manchurian Candidate, Craig Disturbia, Elysium, and Chappie, and Sons of Anarchy, and uh, a long stint on The Walking Dead. Um, did you, did you, you know, I, I didn't track the evolution of your character. Did you ever get bit? Yes, you a lot. Did. I got bit a lot all at once by a pit of, of hungry, sorry, spoiler alert, uh, it's been around a while, so sorry, crew, but, but um, all at once in my head and face. <laughs> in your head and face, and so you were dead, dead, dead to the world. Yeah, I got lowered um, head first into a pit of, of, of really hungry walkers, oh. uh, or did we call them biters uh, in Woodbury? I think we called them biters in Woodbury. Uh, the governor, he did me wrong. So, you know, for any fans of Walking Dead. So did you become a zombie? No, because I had no head. <laughs> so, so when they when they did the smorgasbord of, of uh, Cesar Martinez, um, they cleaned the plate of, of anything neck up right away. So there was no... Oh, know. and so that's how it works with zombies. If, you're, if your head is gone, you're not a zombie? Yeah, yeah. Because early on, I mean, I'm not like you know, really well, um, you know, up to speed on, on all of the zombie rules and walking rules. But, but like if like headshots when they kill, that's why they always go for headshots. Yeah. To you know, incapacitate forever. Because yeah. the, the, there was a fun scene, I think in that episode or the one right before, I think it was right before where there were a bunch of just zombie heads in this cabin that are still trying to bite our legs and feet. And so you kind of have to put the heads out of commission. Oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> Wait a minute. So the heads, even if they're decapitated, their heads stay alive. Yeah, they're and they're can still, do their thing. Yeah, like little piranhas. Yeah. And so you have to shoot it in the brain, and then that kills it. Kills it. That's right. Yeah. But if it doesn't do so, if you just chop off their head, it's it's this. Uh, wow. Yep. It's it's the running. Yeah, like a little little chicken with its head cut off. Wait, were you in the scene with all the, the with all the biting heads? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. were. Yeah. How did they do it? Um, boy, how did they do that one? It's been a while. Um, did they paint out? I think they may have. No, I think at that point we were, we were pretty much in visual effects land, you know, oh, I see. Walking Dead was neat when I first arrived, a lot of uh, what was done was, was practical. Uh -huh. And then slowly a lot of the hits started coming in post with uh, a lot of the blood hits and yeah. what have you started being, you know, digitally put in there. And I think, that was the case with that scene. They had uh, heads. So it was kind of a nice mix between the two of practical and special mm -hmm. effects and then visual effects where they had some heads made. And did they, they may have put green or, or some tape to track and so they could put that. Right. I think that's exactly what they did. And of course, with, with that show, um, it dimly lit at night and um, it, it's, uh, it's the sound effects that really right. get it. Yeah. It, and how much of it was green screened at the, towards the end? Um, well, nothing really. I mean, oh, at okay. least again, well, well, I should say green screen, nothing in terms of uh, the set. We were still always out in, you know, the woods or, or in Sonora, Where'd you shoot? Georgia, in Atlanta, out in and around Atlanta. So Peachtree oh. City. But, okay. but what they would do a lot of is like, say, I, my, my character liked, um, he favored a bat, a bat to kill, you know, with a bat that said, eat me on it, by the way, which I thought was really funny, um, to kill and wield, you know, zombie slaying and, I, towards the end. So that was like your um, signature weapon, in other words? That was the signature weapon, okay. yeah. I would have, the, the second half of the shortened bat was, was painted green, well, it had green tape on it so that okay. it could have the attachment marks for the animators to come in yeah. and it look like I'm really good at killing zombies. <laughs> yeah, a walk Well, to be fair, I mean, you have an extensive martial arts background, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So I liked the shortened bat because it felt a lot like a collie stick. And I came up in Terre Haute, Indiana, practicing quite a bit. What's a collie art. stick? A collie stick, it's made out of rattan. Uh, the martial art originated in the Philippines. Uh -huh. And it's like a 28-inch stick. Uh, it's also known as a, a screema. Um, I think maybe their sticks might be a little longer, shorter. But but the, the sticks are balanced so that you can you know go in and... Um, um, it's a, a little bit similar to uh, nunchucks. Okay. And you can, you know, stick spar and, and uh, the rattan, it's like a whip, but it's also yeah. material that's very difficult to snap and break. Yeah. yeah. Do you still uh, practice martial arts? Not as much. No, uh -huh. I have kids and, and the only martial arts that I practice is protecting myself from, from my daughters who attack me sometimes. <laughs> um, I've got one that's quite rambunctious and I've been teaching her how to box particularly over, you know, my, you know, Joe's homeschool um, distance learning entails uh, wooden knife fighting uh, in the morning, followed by some, some collie sticks. And then we go and throw some hands, we do boxing and sometimes she gets carried away and um, she'll take me out. So, so wow. then I try to work on some, some you know, stuff. it's so funny because you've done so much more action stuff than I've done. I, I did. Uh, in fact, the first time I really did any kind of sign, sign, significant a show that had a significant amount of action was just uh last year there was a show that i was on called emergence okay. and uh an abc show and and uh i did like oh i don't know i did like six five four four, four to six episodes i don't remember how many and uh the uh it was the first show that just had a lot of action in it and i have to say i uh hats off to those stunt folks because sure. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's the stuff you don't think about, you know, um, I think a majority of what I do, it has some uh, action in it and, you know, just whip it, like selling a, a, a head, like a, a punch, yeah. just selling the, the punch after 20 years makes me dizzy. You know, I, I it's not some kind of fancy move, you know, um, like a flying arm bar or a, or a fall or yeah. you know, just selling a punch after this long has started to, you know, and, and I've talked to some stunt guys and it's like your neck and your head and your equilibrium in your ears and um, starting to show my age, but, but just whipping your head around yeah. repeatedly day after day, man, my hat's off to those guys for sure. When they do, when they combine that with car hits and, and, and yeah, burns yeah. and yeah. Yeah. The car stuff was, was, was crazy. I mean, I don't, for some reason, just the, the story, I think it was the nature of the show, but there was just a lot of action, lots of chase scenes, lots of, and, and, and uh, so I, I got, just even in my short stint there, I got a, a little taste of everything. I was in a, I was in a car crash. I was, oh, wow. I was, uh, hit a guy over the head with a tire iron. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> well, what do you was, think? Do you want to do more action stuff? It's fun, right? Or, or it, you... you know, I have to say it was kind of fun. It, it's fun just from a, um, just from an observational standpoint, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. Like a couple of, um, w one of the actors was uh, this guy and uh, I'm blanking on his name, but he's the star of uh, Lost in Space or one of the stars in Lost in Space. And uh, he's, um, oh, I wish I could remember his name, but you know, he's, he's really a semi-professional athlete. I mean, he has a you know, background in, in uh, soccer and and just you know in phenomenal shape and uh, he even he didn't always do his own stunts which he was well capable of he was completely mm -hmm. you know fully trained martial artist and everything like yourself and uh, but he would he would do it all and and it looked every bit as good as the stuntman when he was doing it but they would still break it up so the stuntman was doing a portion of it and then he would do the same thing yeah. but you know. There's a fresh, I mean, there's a, there's a freshness there. And, and, you know, when, when they go in to edit certain fight scenes, um, even going back to Walking Dead, you know, um, Michael Rooker is an, is an incredible, I mean, an incredible martial artist and, and yeah. very physical uh, actor. We have this long drag out fight sequence then, and he likes to do his own thing. But, you know, you have to give the editors so much, uh, so much li like library, if you will, of, yeah. of just moves and stuff that, that, um, you know, they'd cast me in that scene shirtless. And uh, that was not a wise move for me to go with that one because, you know, he kicks me in the stomach so many times with um, gravel that was stuck oh. on his shoe. 
that for the sake of continuity, they would bring in um, Freddie Poole, shout out to Freddie, to come in and make me look good on that fight sequence. Um, just because one, he's an incredible martial artist and, and better than I, but, but he just didn't have the size 10 shoe imprint uh, that was burned into my stomach and chest after Rooker had his way with, with me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's kind of amazing. It, you know, it's funny. It really did give me a whole, I, I, it was com completely an education for me. It, it, it is, it's great fun. There's a, the, the, now I'm curious because in the, um, the way they did it on emergence is the, the, the people who were the central participants in the fight got a tape of the fight, usually a day before, mm -hmm. and then they would, learn their choreography from that and then come in and then review it with the stunt thing. Is that how they did it with you or, or was it happening on set? Yeah, the, some of the, the scenes that are uh, like, a, like a much more complicated or sophisticated sequence, then we would, we would start with pads and mats um, on days that I didn't shoot to come okay. in and start to work on it. And because I had a background, they would, um, you know, very, just, I was very flattered that they would allow me to have input on what moves are, are natural to me. You know, yeah. and I have I have my one go to move that I now have to retire because I think I've used it too much. Where Wait, I have what's this, the move? so I have this one arm. It's from Capoeira, where I take it like a like a backflip, and then that's I the Brazilian it. dance form martial art. Is yes, that right? That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. And I'm not, and I don't do Capoeira, but my brother had taught it to me several years ago. Okay. And so when we're doing a, a break dance or a dance battle with my daughter or anywhere, it comes out, it's my wedding, like this move comes out, but it also comes out <laughs> conveniently when they're like, we need to spruce this fight up. I'm like, I've got one. And so it's this kick. And um, uh, so, so anyway, they'll lean in on you a little bit and say, what kind of moves, what kind of background do you have? And because it's JKD, um, you know, we do a lot of knee elbow headbutts. Things that are a lot of close combat. What's JKD combat. stand for? Jeet Kune Do. It's Jeet Kune Do. Okay. Martial art that uh, Bruce Lee created, and it's very practical. And so when they get into the fancier, you know, more cinematic stuff, then um, I'll uh, I'll reference stuff that my brother taught me that my martial arts instructor in Indiana would be shaking his head at and like, no, you don't do that in these fights. Wait. So this move you were describing, what does it look like? Um, I would do it for you if Zoom would allow. Yeah. Um, but sure, why not? Has anyone done that before in an artist nope. conversation? All nope. Right. This is so, a first. so what I want to do is almost fake it and make it and just throw my legs around uh, so that you'll you'll think that you saw it. But uh, hold on. <laughs> Don't hurt yourself or I'll feel forever. No, no, no. Like I said, I do this move like way too much. So I'm going to take off my mic here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This will be this will be take one. <laughs> All right. So I start off here. Yeah. So oh yeah, of, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's it's sort of like a. The, I don't think I wore the right pants. Cartwheel starting from a sitting position or something. Yeah, and and you, your hand go and you directly go backwards. So it's like a. Yeah, amazing. A, a kick and uh, and like I said, I just realized, you know, wardrobe. You know, um, you have to wear the right pants for. <laughs> <laughs> for that move, <laughs> you know, uh, which, which I've, I learned, boy, going back to, um, you know, one of the first big action films I did was Crank. Yeah. And my character was insane in Crank, and they wanted him really flashy. So I had these, you know, shiny suits and these shoes that had no tread yeah. or traction. And so I was slipping and falling throughout that entire film. Wow. Yeah. So um, the... So we were talking before we started the session. The last time that I recall that we were actually in a room together was in the very room that I'm standing in, which is, this is my bedroom. And I had uh, a fib tib fracture. Oh, yes, and right. you, you had your just, scooter, yep. That's right. I was, I was uh, riding a uh, Razor scooter and uh, <laughs> my son and I decided to have a coasting contest. And I took a corner and I, you know, I think my center of gravity was behind, ended up behind the rear wheel, so it must have popped a wheelie. But the only thing I experienced was all of a sudden I was midair. There was like the scooter just took out from under me, and I was, and then when, when I hit and I was on a turn, so I came down, hit, and the torque just kind of, you know, blew my leg apart. Yikes. It was, it was nasty. yeah. No, I, I remember that. I was impressed uh, how you were soldiering on and 
um, in your, in your <laughs> well, bedroom. You, I think at the time you had, you had just torn an ACL, is that right? Yes, that's right. I tore my left knee ACL. That's yeah, right. Yeah, and you were, you were uh, so you had done a bunch of physical therapy. You were incredibly helpful, actually. I really appreciate it. You know, oh, thanks. thank you. <laughs> I do, actually, I do remember that conversation. I think it was the, um, the, the thing that cools your, t your whole leg. There's mm. a, a machine that you could put on that would keep your leg cold. Yeah, so I never got that. That's, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I could use that on my neck. That wasn't as helpful. Oh boy. Um, yeah, the ACL was was a tough one because I was going into, I was up for a really big franchise, uh, franchise like a film franchise, uh, action related, and I think the opening scene would require me to jump from one rooftop to the other, and of course, you know, we would fake it, but still, just landing, you know, would would you know, and so I I remember I taped my I, I duct taped my leg so that it wouldn't slide, but. Um, you know, I didn't really quite make it through the meeting without anybody noticing just how yeah. bad a shape it was. I thought, you know, I could, I could, I could still muscle my way through uh, yeah. a six month shoot, and I didn't. I just bit the bullet, and I and I did the surgery. It's, it's funny because I had a couple of gigs uh, in the heels of my thing, and um, there were, I did, I, I did a half a season of damages, and like I couldn't walk really, so I would be, you know, like me in a car <laughs> and like. Yes talking to somebody or or me at a at a you know conference table and, and you know that kind of a thing or I'd, or i might take a few steps and they'd be kind of these tentative sort of you know just to walk in you know i didn't tell i don't know if it's my midwest or my my parent what the number my parents did on me because my mom was very very private about everything when she grew up and so with this business and just being known as someone who's who's just a physical actor and that i do a lot of action stuff or or projects that are action oriented I didn't tell anybody initially that I had was hurt, you know, just because, wow. you know, you know, you never know, you know, there's, there's always somebody waiting to take your spot. And, and I didn't tell anybody. Um, I just sort of disappeared for, you know, for six months. And then um, even before we were ready, I, I think I was jumping from a rooftop trailer to another trailer before I should have been uh, because it's such a hey, uh, wait, just for fun. No, no, no. On a movie uh, oh, okay. about six and a half months after my surgery, Oh, um, and my knee was, was quite swollen still. And, and I was on a cane, you know, five months prior before. And so about a month after I had to work on learning how to walk without a limp. Yeah. And, and I thought about, you know, putting it into the character and stuff like that, but I don't know, it just, it felt like, uh, it could sort of, you know, taint a reputation, if you will, amongst yeah, the yeah. company that, that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a whole person anymore uh, with, with terms of action. And it's silly. I've learned so much since then about, about it all, but. but what do you uh, think you've learned? Um, well, no is a really powerful word um, in, in this industry, you know, from saying no to a job to saying no to a scene or mm -hmm. saying no to a stunt um or or no to even an affectation and and you know b before I, it was always that fear that you know we would be seen as difficult or yeah. um you know or, or some type of entitled prima donna like oh i, I don't want to do that or you know and and because so many directors have known me as being that guy who you know i, I take falls without pads and or mats or anything and not a big deal like you know after a hit or something and so uh, that now looking back, it's like now I, I realize that I have to be able to live, you know, and, and my career, of course, not that, not that it's not everything still, but when I first got into it, so obsessed that I didn't think about um, what life is like after, you know, injuries and, 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 and those kind of movies. And, and I look back on them fondly, but, you know, I'm a softball coach, you know, and when yeah. my kid gets a hit, that trumps anything I've ever yeah. done anywhere in the world. Yeah, and, and, and if I and if I had if I had said no to a couple of things, maybe you know I I, I could be out there even longer pitching to her and, and her team. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. It is funny how it's hard getting used to that concept, and but I think part of it it seems I'm wondering what your thoughts on this because it seems to me the trick is to that it doesn't have to be conflict based. You know, when you're saying no to something, it doesn't need to be combative. It's just oh, I'm actually not comfortable with that because of blank. And, and, and I've never found people, you know, pushing back very hard when I expressed discomfort with something. They were like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, 
Yeah, um, and and I, and I think that's what I learned is that it was always that it's more of a collaboration than a dialogue. Like, are you down for this? It, it wasn't. You're absolutely right. And if if I go back in time and and if I, it doesn't have to be a no. It would have been. I guess it's tact is what I've learned. You know. It's, yeah. Right. It's just, you know, you can. It's not an all or nothing that you know. Just the way I would have treated it, a non. Uh, action oriented scene in terms of you know blocking or or where you're you know how you're entering um is this, is basically the same thing with with some of these stunts it's it's yeah. that fluid you know um so i have i have a question you know uh, um a lot of the folks who will see this of course are actors and and uh you know you're a bear group alum and, and i'm always fascinated with the interface between the kinds of things we learn in a sort of a um you know, off the job environment where things are very open and, and uh, I don't know what the right word is, but nurturing and all this stuff. And, and certainly, you know, you're, you're learning uh, techniques and tools that can be applied on the job, but they're also, you're practicing them in an environment where there's just a lot of, of uh, room. Uh, for yeah. lack of a better word, to to just play and, and stuff. And I'm always fascinated with the interface between that, these tools that you learn to loosen up, free up and everything. And then how does that interface with the on the job uh, experience you're having where, some, where a director's like perhaps just throwing a result at you and just saying, you know, I, I, need, I need you to do this, whatever it is. Um, and I'm not talking about the physical things per se, but you know, right. um, yep. how does that work for you? What happens when you get a result thrown your way that that's funky. Um, on on cue, it's almost like my, my dog wants to respond. Let me tell him to be quiet, please. One, sorry, my, my, Amazon must be here. Um, so so in term, that's a great question. You know, I um, I do get that one a lot when I, when I talk to students, and sometimes it feels like the obligation of a of a director just giving a note itself raises, and I like it. It raises the the pressure, the blood pressure, or whatever. You know, it, it's not to say that we shouldn't stay, you know, relaxed and, and and free, but just just getting a note in itself is going to cause some type of a change. Yeah. And if I don't necessarily get the result that they wanted, I'm not sure that they always know exactly what result. You know, and and to use a bad example, I don't think I've ever had a director say "cry on this line," but let's just for the example say it's "cry on this line," and they're going to push in, and 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 there's all kinds of stuff that has to happen um, on the crew and camera in order for me to get that one line crying, or 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 at least well, whatever. So, just the pressure and the obligation of it um, is going to cause some type of different take yeah and 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 if if i'm uncomfortable and all of a sudden i don't feel like it's coming then there's some sweat there there's some fear there that still works and and yeah. and, and then the director you know will will feel sometimes that oh you know what i have a new idea now or yeah. or you know yeah i think but, you're you know i think what you just said is spot on i think frequently you know, as an actor, we feel that the director knows exactly what they want and it's our job to deliver it and oh no. But I think what you said is actually much more accurate and representative of directors where they get an idea of something and they'll throw you a note and it's going to move in a direction, but they may not know exactly what they want. And in fact, a lot of directors that I've encountered are afraid to uh, share that. They, they feel like, oh, oh, they're supposed to know. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so what you just said, I think is spot on that a note comes your way, it's going to change something. Mm -hmm. And even to the extent of the, the older I get, you know, the, the, the more I just sort of freely let it roll off my back and, and like, trust that my subconscious will take care of it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, they'll say, uh, you know, if they say like cry on this line, um, I just immediately, my, my subconscious, I go like, it's got it. I don't know what any of that is. And there definitely is a change. And, you know, so a lot of times I'll end up crying. And, and then, and if I did, if for some reason there's not water ro running down my face, it's exactly as you described. There are other things going on. Sometimes just the anxiety of knowing you have to deliver something is shows up and, and uh, it, it's a, it's a lot easier when you free yourself of trying to get it trying to deliver a fixed result. You know, you know I, I'm a big fan. Thanks for saying that. And, and you give me way more credit. I think I deserve it. But, but I think um, 
I'm a big fan of the term or of the words um, accidental genius. You mm -hmm. know, um, if 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 they say cry on this line, which again I don't think a director's ever thank goodness told me to do or or, or <laughs> you know what challenge, put, you know I'll put the challenge out there. Let's do it. But but um, the accidental genius part of it is if I find that the camera's coming in, they're pushing in, they they want this big effect and this result, and I don't do it. I, I react in a, in a way that's like, I, well, I blew that and, and I blew that and all of a sudden I relax, relax or yeah. I find it funny that I, <laughs> oh, I was way off there, right? Like, and it's, and it's funny. And then the director come over and was like, man, that was genius. You know, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. was me just commenting on the fact that I not only blew the note, that I just, I wasn't even close. Yeah. And I need another take. And, and, and all of a sudden, they're like, wow, that was great. You know, and, and uh, again, I call it the accidental genius stuff. Yeah. Because um, it all, you know, I love the, the idea that, and, and I love the, going back to this is, um, you know, every emotion is technically engendered in the scene. You know, um, yeah. there is no one way to, to do something. And I'm often, that's a, that's a lesson I have to relearn a, a lot. I always, the way I always think of it is, you know, we. I don't think emotions are singular things. I think that the whole notion of just, you know, angry or sad or anything is, is in a sense, a complete fabrication. I think that what happens is we're experiencing something that we might call emotions at the speed of electricity from a scientific standpoint, you know, rather literally just coursing through our nervous system and everything and triggering up all these responses. And if I think of any moment in my life where I felt like I was dominantly one thing, like, you know, I was very angry. If I really were to unpack it and dissect it, it's like, oh, I felt a zillion trillion things in milliseconds, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, this is a, uh, as an actor, I find this to be a huge relief because if somebody says, you know, I want to see this one thing, I'm like, oh yeah, that's in the palette. You know, yeah, yeah that's there. I just I, somewhere in there that's there, as opposed to trying to fixate on that on that single thing, you know. It, you know. So now I'm. Oh, how old am I? I'm in my uh, early forties. And when I first started in LA, um, I played a lot of villains, and I still play villains now and again. But but a lot of you know villainous roles. And my secret, you know, I'd go in with my with my secret was that I would always play the character the quote unquote opposite way that was on the page. And, and you know, if this character was, was insane with, with, you know, with rage and words on the script that was angry and, and I would hear um, the other actors when I'm in the waiting room yelling and yeah. pounding and things, yep. I knew I'd gonna book the role because I'd always yeah. come in and I would, I would whisper, I was very calm. And then I would find things very funny when, yeah. well, you know, and, and, and Boy, I, I was so busy. My dance card was quite busy just using that that um, effect of, of saying, you know what, anger, you know, and rage is, is sometimes scarier um, when when he, he's so he's so enraged or he's so crazy and out there as a villain, you know, that that he finds it all of this amusing and yeah, uh, yeah, and I would uh, and that's something that I brought, you know, because of and I, I give you and, and Lee quite a bit of credit. Oh, that's, that's very nice. Taking um, the circumstance out of it. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny, you know, it's, I, I, you're saying all that and I'm thinking of all these villains that I've seen over the years and who made whole careers out of being just the nicest guys on the planet, you know, <laughs> while they were doing these, um, I don't, Klaus Maria von Brandauer and uh, Chris Walken and, and Marlon Brando and, and, you know, they just, they're like the nicest guy in the world. And then he's raping Blanche. And, and it's just, you know, it's just a, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating thing. I think that it's so common for, you know, actors to see, to get an impression off the page and then to feel obligated to in some way communicate that and that we, I need to, to relay this. And I always quick to, to sort of point out because of the way I look at things that, well, if you got that from the page, the audience is getting that from the page too. You're going to be saying those words. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, if you do something, you know, I don't know what the particular villains you play do, but I imagine some pretty nasty stuff. <laughs> right. and, and, and when they do that, it's scary and evil. And it's not, it's not, it doesn't require a particular attitude or anything. Yeah, if, if that's like their everyday, you know, dealing, 
you know, yeah. then, then what's, what's scary is that um, just how easy that they can, you know, like in Sons of Anarchy, you know, throw, throw this actress in the trunk of my car, you know, and, yeah. and kidnap her and do it with some swagger because this is like, you know, just going to the mailbox and taking some, you know, getting, getting yeah. the mail, if, if you will. You, you know, I, I, it's funny, but playing so many villains for so long um, and, I, and I'm a Midwest guy. And so I always tell Canadians that I work with, you know, um, you're not going to, you're not going to out polite me or, or, you know, after you, after you. Um, but then I play these really dark characters. Um, but I'm that actor, I think that you love to forget. And so when I'm walking around my dailies, you know, and, and I always notice that people look at me kind of like twice and it's not because they recognize me as an actor. I think they've over the years of 20 years, just systemically <laughs> said, I don't know about this guy, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so I always, I find myself overcompensating with being like really nice yeah. because I can feel attention sometimes in the room because they don't recognize me as being an actor, uh, but they recognize me as someone that, that they don't like for some reason. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, which is kind of fun to me because it's nice to, to say, well, I guess it's working, you know? And <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is very bizarre when reality and, uh, and entertainment conflate. I have this strange story that came up for me, but just while we're talking, I, I just wanted to um, let everybody know, uh, th those of you who are, who are watching, if you have questions or comments or anything that you'd like to pose at any point, just feel free to use the participants button and uh, raise your hand and I'll, I will watch for it. And, uh, and then I'll call on you and stuff and we'll, we'll include you in the, in the conversation. Um, what I was going to tell you the story of, it's uh -huh. just the craziest thing. I may have told this story on one of these artist conversations. It's just one of the weirdest things I've experienced. My father passed away two years ago and um, it was the same year that um, I played this uh, doctor character on Billions and uh, there had just, I had just had a, a couple of episodes in a row that where the story was all about my character. I love you on that show. Yeah, and, I, I like Billions. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so um, anyway, my dad died on, on, it was, I think, believe on a Thursday and uh it was, I had, it's hard to explain, but I had to get to California immediately. And I had this window of, uh, I think it was about a, a three hour, three and a half hour window to get home, pack, get to the airport and, and hop on this plane in order to get out. And it was very, very tight. And so what happened was I got there and I packed and I was ready to, to, uh, you know, grab a, a car to the airport. And the, um, my, my daughter uh, looked at me and she goes, um, you know, at the time she was 16, she just goes, well, what am I going to eat? And I realized, oh my God, I haven't like, I don't have, I haven't left her with any money or anything. I, she's, so I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, I'll, We'll, we'll, we'll go right now. I'll walk the dog and walk with me to the store. And then you can go into the store and I'll give you my card and you go to the cash machine and you'll have money for the, for the weekend. And then uh, and we'll do it that way. And then I'll just take a car from the store and, and figure it out just the right time. So we do that and we're at the store and she's in. And this, um, and this was literally, like, so my father, I had found out the news of my father at around 2.30 or something. And now it's about five. And, and this, um, person from my neighborhood comes up who looked familiar to me um, as, a, as in just somebody I'd seen around the neighborhood, but I didn't really know her. And she, she, just, come, she just came up with her husband. She said, oh, you know, I'm really sorry. And, and I was like, oh, you know, um, yeah, thank you. And I, and I figured, I guess Lee told some of her friends and it got around or something. I didn't really understand. And she was talking and they're going on and on and on. And she talked, my daughter came out and there, she was talking to me. This woman was talking to me for like, you know, five, six minutes. And I was kind of trying to let her know politely that I, I need to run, but thank you so much and everything. And then she just turns to her husband and goes, he's the doctor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I realized the entire time they were talking about being sorry for what happened to my character on the show. And I was in my world, I was like, this woman is giving me consolation over my father's death, who I don't really know, but that's very nice of her and everything. It's just so strange. That's that's good. That's does that kind of stuff ever happen to you where you conflate where it conflates? 
Oh my goodness. Um, well, yes, that, that way, I, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a story. You know, when I do like certain conventions for like Walking Dead and stuff, what I find interesting is that there's some super fans and this is probably not really in the family of what you're talking about, but I'll have, um, I'll have fans come up and, and, uh, and really address me with exactly what you what you're saying, what what just happened, and I'm I'm kind of confused until they say stuff that's very on the nose, like um, I was just happy when you died, and I was like, oh, we're going back to the show. We're talking oh, okay, about the yeah, show. Yeah. Oh, okay, I got it. I got <laughs> it. You know, it's, especially since there's so much time that passes between when something airs and right. you know, and, and when you know people see it, or when you air and when you shoot it, and um, there's references there. For sure, I, I think, you know, because I've died in like everything I've ever done. <laughs> I think I think the, the best trivia question would be, "What didn't I die?" Is that true? That literally everything. Almost, you've done? yeah. I would say probably like ninety percent of what I've done. I think I oh I, I, I had a lot of on screen deaths, and um, there'll be some again like transposing an, an experience and bringing it with me. I have some really vivid nightmares and dreams um, really? when I when I finish certain dying scenes um you know if, if especially those that come and and um how i put this that, that are just very visceral in, in how you die you know like like when you get shot or, or like a squib goes off or something you know there's maybe them a little bit of a spark and just for burn. people who don't know squibs are, are these sort of little uh, i would you describe mini explosive devices in a way it's a little that, charge that will give the impression that you've been shot or something yes yeah. Yeah, it's it's when I'm like buried, like like on Sons of Anarchy, I was literally buried up to my neck, um, in, in you know in gravel, and these motorcycles are going at my face and stuff like that. Or or um, on this movie called El Chicano, I was freezing. I was shooting in Canada, and I was covered in so much fake blood that down in my socks and underwear because uh, I'd had this, I'd been shot in the in the neck um, that I that I couldn't stop shivering for hours. And, uh, and those come to play, they came to play for a while, you know, uh, on me when I was sleeping. For sh really? For sure. No kidding. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those would, would leave an imprint, but, but for the most Why part, Why do you think you know, that is? Um, I think because it, it gets, you know, there's, there's so much pressure that, you know, there's pressure in there, you know, you, you have to hit certain physical, um, marks, mm -hmm. you know, accurately. And yeah. so there's pressure there. And then, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing the demise of, of yourself. It, it feels like, um, it always feels like a, like a, a cousin or a brother is passing to me is what it feels like. Cause you've lived with the kids wow. for a while. And so it, it's, it's that, you know, combining of, uh, intertwining of, of something obviously emotional and, and the physical duress that you go through and a lot of physical scenes to me is breathing, you know, breathing. I always give myself a headache. Um, if I have to ADR, like do the, uh, um, the, the additional dialogue requirements for a yep. scene that, that I'm dying in or I'm doing a fight scene of some kind that I ultimately die in. And then the actual scene on the day, I always, I always end up with this crazy massive headache. And a lot of it has to do with breathing and you get this inten intensity of breathing until you finally go and then you're holding your breath. And so you've got this intense amount of breathing followed by, by no breathing at all. And then you do it repeat. 15 times or 20 yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. I've, you know, I, I've so been I, think, I think because I'm an outside in kind of actor, I think that's why it comes to play with me later. Sorry. What, what does that mean to you when you say outside in? Um, so, as we were talking about earlier, you know, you, you can't really label, you know, one emotion, one color to yeah. a scene or to a, to a, right? So, so outside in meaning, um, you know, my character's going to die right now, right? And so you, you, you start the blocking out and you're not really sure how it's going to go. And maybe it's a car hit or a, a gunshot. And, um, and I'm not really feeling the weight of the scene yet. You know, right. I'm feeling the, the, all of the safety um, meetings of, hey, there's going to be an explosion yeah. that comes through the glass. Then yeah. you're going to, oh, make sure you have ear protection, all that stuff. And so all this stuff's happening really fast. And I'm not even in the world of the character yet or yeah. the, of, you know, of the, the imaginary circumstances yet. I'm just literally physically saying, okay, this is, guys, this glass on the right of them, it's, it's, uh, that's real glass, so we, we want to stay away from that. But these X's here, that's all going to be rubber glass. Uh, there's going to be smoke. We're going to lift the car and shake it a little bit. Like all these things, and you're like, 
okay. And then they're like, then they come up with their notes to you personally. And you're like, oh, sorry, I missed all of that because I'd already had my ear protection in. <laughs> and then they're like, enrolling. I'm like, well, hold eh, all right. So then you put it in and uh, you're like, well, I can't really do anything until I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by this squib hit on my neck. You yeah. know, um, anyway, so, so when I say outside in, I don't think about um, what's going to come up for, for me, Joe, uh, when the squib goes off and the camera pushes in and, and maybe there'll be some tears and, and some, some panic, of course. And, uh, and if you were trying to map that out in your hotel room the night before, I don't really yeah. find that is going to be of any help to me. But, yeah. but, but if I just own what's happening outside of all the pressure and the sound and the noise, and then I feel the, 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 the sticky blood that oddly tastes good because it's always syrup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then that gives me real life that I get to now enjoy and discover in the moment and say, How'd that look? Did that was that believable? Was that good? And 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 they're like, oh, it was you know, it was great. It was intense, or you know, and, and then the emotions that come up for me. That's why I say outside in. It's it's uh, it's the it's the pressure. It's the intensity. It's the breathing. It's maybe it's banging my fist against that glass that I remember that I'm not supposed to touch because maybe that is the one that's going to go if you hit it too hard. That's right. There was literally a scene where they would say because I'm very careful with props and and, sure. and, and and you know. So when they told me to close the door, to close it gently. And because the whole thing, if you bump it, it's going to fall. It's right. going to break and shatter. And so when makeup comes in to do their last touches or hair is, well, I don't have a lot of hair, but it's going to do the last touches or whatever's going to happen with props. I was always very mindful in telling them, oh, be careful with the door. Oh, be careful with the door. And, um, and, and that's where I think it's always helped me because I put my attention off of myself and onto you know objects or, or something that somebody, so be careful if anybody out there ever directs me, please don't kill me in the movie. But but um, you know, when you tell me to be careful of, of something, man, the scene will become about that for me, uh, good or bad. So, so like Walking Dead, for example, um, I have this grenade launcher and I have to shoot this guard tower. And right before we go in the rehearsal, the armorer tells me, hey, that's the only one of those that we have. And that thing is like, you know, so, so whatever happens, don't drop that thing when you do your cowboy thing of jumping off the back of this truck. So I'm like, okay, well, there was an accident on set. There was a miscue and the driver was supposed to go five miles an hour and said he went 40. And oh, then yeah. he hit the brakes and the Ugh. camera dolly, which has two grown men on it and you know, all the, and they, they didn't lock it down. And so it pinned me against the cab of the truck oh, God. And, and the camera, the, the, the whole camera dolly. But, but there's a picture of me. I'm still holding the, okay, the, 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 the grenade launcher up and uh um you know to my own detriment just to protect this this prop at all costs yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and and they're like you should have just dropped that thing and, and wait break so you were pinned between the camera dolly and the truck yeah the back of the uh the so i was sitting on the camera bed. dollies by the way everybody in case you don't know are incredibly heavy it's, it's yeah. very serious go ahead so, i i i i have a small I had a small fracture in my back from the whole thing. Oh my God. Uh, and, and it was because I was, um, wait a minute. You said in your back. So is it a, a, on a vertebra in other words? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Mid, mid back. And if I touch it, it still hurts. Oh. Yeah, I can still remember it. But, but that right before we yelled, you know, action on rehearsal, um, just that note of saying, Hey, be careful with that gun or be careful with that thing. You know, that became, you know, so sort of like the last thing I hear or I'm told when it comes to anything external, I will, um, I'm, I don't want to say I'll make it about that. I'm just, I'm just very mindful of it. And Well, the interesting thing that you're describing that, I mean, all that said, it, it to me reflects actually a, a, whether this is by choice or by instinct for you, a really good habit. Because I, I believe that as we put our attention on these other things and we're not, at all manipulating what we're thinking or what we're feeling, then we are freely thinking whatever and freely mm -hmm. feeling whatever. And it, the way I always think of it is if you're trying to feel something, you look like somebody trying to feel something. It's like, it's not like the camera misses any behavior. It's, you know, it's there, it's catching whatever you're doing. And yeah. unless the story is about somebody trying to feel something, mm -hmm. then, you know, that, that could be trouble. But, so I, I think that this habit you're describing is actually incredibly useful for your acting. And I've always noticed that, that in, in, you know, in your work, you're just very, 
loose and free and, and real and all that stuff. And I, so I think that that attention on the outside is actually a good thing. Thank you. You know, there, there's, um, there's something that you say in your book that I loved, uh, which, which may have trickled down. So I'll, I'll blame my, um, my back fracture on you. I'm kidding. Um, which is great. You know, it, you know, you talk about the candlesticks in your book and, and that's something if I ever have the luxury of being able to walk around a set when no one is there and going around and, and assigning an anecdote or a story oh, yeah, yeah. to something, because, you know, I'm giving the highlights of when someone, uh, on the crew or director tells me to be mindful of something, but when they don't, one of my favorite things to do that, that I, uh, I ripped from Barrow Group or I was trained in Barrow Group is, is to go and endow little stories that are very short yeah. um, to, to an object. And, uh, and, and the way I think that technology has helped me, because I'm not a big tech, I don't think I'm a tech person, but everybody says that, uh, that they're not, and they, they, they're very reliant on it, is um, if, if there are certain emotions that are referenced, uh, again, we can't really work that way, but if we want to do outside in, I'll go and, and Google some images and then I'll go around and, and start assigning objects that I see around the set to the images that, that I respond to. So, so bad example, let's say it's, you know, it, it's rage. It's always more descriptive than that. And I get very specific when I Google stuff, but, but let's say it's rage and, and, and it's just people screaming or I'm always surprised at what comes up. It's rage against machines. Like, Oh yeah. Rage. So, so then I'll, I'll, I'll do that and I'll go around the set and I'll, figure out a couple of objects that I might come into contact with that fit somehow into this picture. And then now that story uh, becomes just a lot of fun. And, and, and so um, when I, and then forget about it, as you say, yeah. that is the most important part of it is don't make it about that. And then come in and, and uh, oh, it's like, Oh, there's, you know, this character is, is screaming at me. And it's like, Oh, she's the one that's enraged. And, and, and I'll start nodding to one of these songs from Rage Against the Machine, you know, so, so stuff like that, if I have the ability to, or the luxury of time, and I say the luxury of being able to walk around a set before we, we can, um, I've always, I like objects for that reason. Yeah, yeah, I, I do as well. That, that exercise you're describing, which uh, I, I think of as object loading is, is, it's exactly what you described is you give a short story. To, I mean, the idea is that in real life, all the things that are around us have histories. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we we could look at it like I'm in my room, I'm looking at a lamp, and I go, oh yeah, I remember when we bought that lamp, and and uh, I, in fact, I remember the uh, the argument we had about that about <laughs> whether that should be the lamp, and uh, I half won, um, and uh, hi. hi, we're on uh, the artist conversation. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> that was a cameo from Lee Brock. Oh my goodness, um, so. so uh, Anyway, what I was going to say is that, you know, the, the trick is very much as you described, because you, as a technique, is you give it a quick backstory, just a few things. And then, like you said, it's about forgetting about it, because it doesn't matter whether you're conscious of it or not when you're playing. Sometimes you'll remember and sometimes you won't. It really, it really doesn't matter. But at the same time, just by providing a little bit of history around you, it, it tends to create possible stimulus you know you, you might get stimulated by something when you're playing and, um, and t t touching things you know one of the first films that i did right after the bear group i was a lead in a movie called shackles and yeah. um i just remember you know just just grounding yourself and touching objects I, I was in a prison cell and um i'd never been in a prison cell you know and, and so just I started thinking like, hmm, I'm just gonna start playing with stuff. And, and you start to realize, oh yeah, this character has been there that long that he's probably traced his finger around every square inch of, of that cell, you know, and whether the camera catches it or not, it was always a really helpful. Uh, yeah, that sounds fun. That's amazing. Well, believe it or not, Joe, our, we just wailed through our time. This thing always goes so fast. Um, I'm so flattered I, that you uh, had me and have me here. I'm, uh, I'm beyond grateful that you, that you joined us and, uh, you know, we'll continue these things and maybe we'll have you back. That would be great. And uh, just just great to see you. It's been a cool. long time. Thank you. you know? There's uh, one thing I wanted to reference and, and I'll let you go. Maybe this, you know. Yeah, please. You know, pompously, you know, like, well, let me throw something out to the students. But, but something I've helped that you'd said about, um, you know, again, this idea of, of what emotions, you know, they are claimed or, or, or results um, are claimed of the scene. And we realize, well, there's actually a whole range of colors that are happening. When I first come into contact with material, whether it's uh, because I'm gonna go shoot it or I'm auditioning for it, 
uh, one of the first, first things I do is I retype. I don't read the stage directions and I retype the scene. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when I've come to you, I always just have scenes that say you and me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll just completely rip, rip all this. And then I'm always surprised. So then I get the material. It's very helpful for auditions, I think, because that's all it is, the basic human interaction. And you can't yeah. honor oftentimes these really crazy you know, exter externals. And, uh, and then I'll read the actual stage directions um, when I'm in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and I find that to be really helpful for the reasons that, that you're referencing. So that's sort of been my trick, if you yeah. will, to, to not try to uh, own every single color in an audition that is, that is printed and put in there. Yeah, yeah. That's great. What a great thing to do. Keeps it really fresh, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's so great. Well, thanks so much for spending a, a, a great time with you. us and thank you everybody who, who, who joined in and uh, uh, we will, we do these on occasion. So if you look uh, to our website, beargroup.org, you'll see the list of all of our programming, which includes these artist conversations, but there's also just, just a whole bunch of programming to look for. Uh, and, and uh, so beargroup.org is the name of that. And uh Joe, so good to see you. Uh, all my love to uh, your family and, and uh, all the best. Uh, this has been a delight. Thank you so much. It's been all nice right, being, uh, being an artist again, or at least being called an artist again during all of this. So. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. 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 yeah all right. These words. All right. Have a good day. Take it easy. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.